The title of this morning's sermon is Deacons and the Session and Ministry of Our King. So, Lord willing, in a few weeks, we will have deacons. New English-speaking deacons for our church. This is so exciting, and this is very historic. And in light of this exciting and historic time here at our church, here at Highland, uh, I thought it would be very good to consider this account from Acts chapter 6, 1 to 7, an account about deacons and the session or the ministry of our King, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Think with me here. After Jesus finished his work of salvation, so after he lived that perfect, righteous life for us, after he died to pay the penalty for our sins, and after he rose again from the dead in victory, what happened? Do you remember what happened? Jesus ascended. He ascended into heaven. And that is really, really important because Jesus, who is God the Son, in his ascension, he ends up sitting at the right hand of God the Father. The Son sitting at the right hand of the Father. And what that is, is it means that Jesus is now the King. I don't want to overthink this. We're not saying that Jesus was not the king before that happened. I'll explain that some other time. But in terms of redemptive history, time and space, for us to understand Jesus has ascended and taken his throne of glory and exaltation and authority. That is what is called the session of Jesus, S-E-S-S-I-O-N. The word session is basically here just a nice Latin word that means sitting. Jesus is now sitting upon his throne. The church, the church universal, our church locally, the church is under his Session. This means that Jesus is our chief pastor. He is our chief minister and teacher and shepherd here at Highland. This also means that Jesus is, one could say like this, the chief elder of our church. And this also means, therefore, he is, in a sense, the chief deacon of our church. And what all this simply means is that Jesus is the one who loves us and grows us and serves us and cares for us, for Highland, first and foremost. This is such an important point. I'm making just this one point this morning, but it is so, so huge. This is what the church is all about. What are we doing here? We are receiving the ministry of Christ through his servants. It is not ultimately me speaking to you or caring for you or feeding you. It is Jesus himself. I'm not saying I'm Jesus. I'm not saying I'm special. I'm saying Jesus is special. You are too. Well, yeah, if everyone's special, then no one's special. All right, we'll talk about that later. But you are that important to him that he is the one who is shepherding you. That's what the church is all about. And actually, that's what the book of Acts is all about as well. The whole book of Acts is story after story after story of what? The Acts of the Apostles? Yeah, in one sense, that's true. But ultimately, the book of Acts is story after story after story 
about Jesus who is actively ministering to his church. And we see that here in today's passage. In today's passage, Jesus lovingly created and provided the person and work of the deacon so that his church would be taken care of, so that his church could grow in spiritual well-being. Here we go. Let's dive right in. It begins by telling us in verse 1 that Jesus' church was growing in numbers. It says that the disciples were increasing in number. This is wonderful news. There were more men and women, more boys and girls, more babies becoming visible members of the church. And this was such a good thing. What a great thing. But good things often bring about good problems. The church in Acts 6 began to lack in manpower. In verse 1, it continues to tell us that, quote, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution, end quote. What's going on here is that food and resources were being collected and then distributed for the sake of any church members who were poor, any church members who were powerless, who needed help. And one of the poorest and most powerless of all were widows. Women without families. Women who had no physical protection or economic stability. And so because of the lack of manpower, certain widows were being neglected. Now, there's no indication in the text that the neglect was intentional or malicious. It looks like there was just simply, although that sounds bad, there was simply a breakdown in manpower and logistics. They were neglected because there were just too many to take care of and too little to oversee that. But here's what makes this really scary. The breakdown in the manpower and the logistics began to result in a breakdown in unity. You see that the Hellenist widows were being neglected. And when the Hellenist church members saw that, they submitted a complaint against others, against the Hebrew church members. Who were these people? It's very simple. Hellenists were members of the church who were Greek in their language and in their culture. Meanwhile, the Hebrews were members of the church who were Hebrew in their language and their culture. So these two groups were starting to feel the disunity because of the neglect of the widows from one of these groups. Not intentional, not malicious as far as we can tell. But the results was not good. This was a big and serious issue. There was a lack of manpower, a breakdown in the distribution and care for certain widows, widows, and the beginning of disunity. That's serious stuff. But praise be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The issue was big and serious indeed. But Jesus is the head of the church. He's in control. And he loves his sheep. He cares for and loves for loves the widows. And he also cares for and loves both Hellenists and Hebrews. He cares for and loves his church. And so this is what he did. This is what Jesus did while he was sitting upon his throne. This is what Jesus did for his church under his session. He had the 12 apostles separate the manpower and the ministry of diaconal care. He separated that from the manpower and the ministry of pastoral care. He designed and he structured his church so that two different groups of men would focus on these two different duties these two different realms of acts of service for his people. 
We see that very simply and plainly in verses 2 to 4. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up on preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the wisdom, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Jesus made this happen. This was his will. This is profound. This is profound because the fullness and the totality of all of Christ's ministry, it was and it is and it always will be until Jesus comes back, obviously. It will, it will be way too much for one group of men, let alone one single man, to handle. Jesus' session is that immense and that extraordinary. Jesus' session, his ministry, is that magnificent and breathtaking. The twelve, they did not do what they did because they thought that serving tables was beneath them. They did what they did in order to uphold both the glorious importance of the ministry of the word and prayer and the glorious importance of serving tables and helping the poor. Both at the same time. Jesus' session is so huge, it's too huge, it's too wonderful for the church to either have to pick one side of the ministry, of ministry at the expense of the other Jesus' session is too huge and too amazing for the church to just try to do both at the same time, but do both with like subpar, lukewarm job. The feeding of people's poor souls with the word of God and the feeding of people's poor stomachs with God's literal daily bread. What man what singular group of men can do all of that? No one. And that was by design. The fullness and the totality of all of Christ's ministry. Jesus himself, obviously, he is God. He can do that all on his own, and he does, ultimately, in a sense. But us humans here on earth, as we run the church, as we do church his way, no way. And we see that here in the book of Acts, in this story. The manpower just broke down. They needed more men to administer Christ's session. Well, the result of Jesus' ac session activity is such an encouragement to us. You see what happens in verse 5 and 6. The whole gathering of the church was pleased with what the 12 apostles did when they separated the two realms of ministry. They chose seven brothers to focus upon the diaconal ministry of the church. And in the next week or two, I'm going to explain more about what that means. In verse 5 and 6, they chose these men. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Permenus, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Stephen was the one who was killed and martyred by stoning. Remember him? Philip, he was the one who evangelized to the Ethiopian eunuch. Nicholas, it says he was a proselyte of Antioch. Really quickly, what does that mean? The word proselyte means that this man, Nicholas, he was first converted from a Gentile to a Gentile who practiced Judaism, and then he converted again. He converted from a Gentile who practiced Judaism to a Gentile Christian who believed in Jesus. So that's what that word means. We don't know much about the other men in this list, but we do know this. There were seven of them. I'm not super duper into numbers, but that pops out very clearly. For as many of you know, the number seven symbolizes the abundance of of Jesus' provision for his church and the perfection of Jesus' session over his church. And so the whole gathering of the church 
set before the twelve apostles these seven men, and the apostles prayed, and, and then they laid their hands on them. If you come to the ordination service, Lord willing, we will ordain some new deacons. You will see that happen. Um, pastors and elders putting their hands on new deacons, deacon nominees. What's going on there? The laying of hands is ordination. It's a conferring. It's a bestowing of a calling to administer the session of Jesus Christ. It's not, not magical. There's nothing special going on. It's not like the force is being transferred from one person to another or anything like that. It's simply a visible recognition that the calling to the ministry of deacon, it does not ultimately belong to or come from man. It doesn't come from the seven, from, from the apostles. Ultimately, it comes from Jesus. It belongs to Jesus. It comes from our king. I hope you're seeing my main point over and over again this morning. Jesus actively built his church in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is really a book about his acts. And there's even more to be encouraged about. As I wind this sermon to a close, we look at verse 7, which is so important to see. The outcome of Jesus' session activity, it says this, the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This morning, I just want to focus on the first part. Notice the first words. The word of God continued to increase. It doesn't say, first and foremost, that the numbers of the church members increased or that the work of the ministry increased. It says the word of God increased. This is to say that God's word is central. The session of Christ happens when the word increases. When the written word of God, that is the Bible, when that is read more and preached more and taught more and studied and meditated upon more and shared more, when God's word is central, that's the session of Christ being administered at best. Diaconal ministry, make no mistake, it's good and necessary. We need deacons. But deacons exist. Look at this story. Deacons were created for the sake of upholding the primacy of the ministry of the word and prayer. Remember the words of the apostles. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God. It is not right. That's strong language. And so when we think about our new deacons being formed, that is happening so that people like me, Pastor Jason, elders of our church, we can focus more on God's word and increase the centrality of the word of God, which is primary to our church. And so thanks be to God that the ministry of the word was never given up, but instead it was lifted up higher for the sake of Christ's sheep and not at the expense of diaconal work. More men were called, and now both the word, the ministry of the word, and the ministry of practical love and care are now fully functional, fully 100%. That is awesome. We can safely assume that those Hellenist widows, it doesn't tell us how it turned out, but we can assume that they, they got their distributions. We can also safely assume that the breakdown in the unity was avoided, that this worked. I mean, this worked because this was God's plan. This was Jesus' will. He's the head of the church. He designed it. And above all, we can absolutely know for sure that the word of God continued to increase because it says it right there. And that's everything to us. The word of God is life to us. And so what an encouragement to read this. The session of Christ happening in the book of Acts. In closing, Dear Highland, as I said in the beginning, Lord willing, in a few weeks, we will have deacons. 
our deacons have another week to take their exams. The window closes at the end of next week. Um, I'll score them, tally the results. I hope that they all pass. We're praying that that's the case. And, uh, and then I believe it's the 24th, a few Sundays later, um, that will be the day upon which we would ordain them along with um, the KM nominees too. I don't know how exactly it's going to look like, but um, I'll let you know. But that's kind of the plan. Then in a few weeks, it's crazy, right? In a few weeks, we might have a few deacons in the EM. That's ex very exciting. This is huge. This is, this is historic. This is the first time ever in the history of our church this is happening. But I open this mini-series by just telling you this. Remember, please remember, whether you're just, whether you're a deacon nominee right now, stressing out about this exam, or you're the rest of us who are supporting, cheering you on. Remember, Jesus is sitting upon his throne right now. The church is under his session. Remember that Jesus invented deacons, not humans, ultimately. And remember that Jesus is the chief deacon of the church. This is all about his ministry, his love, his care for his people. That's why I'm so excited. Highland, we've been a great church up to this point. I don't have much to complain about at all when I talk to my fellow pastor friends. Well, well they do. <laughs> I, I love this church. We are blessed with wonderful people, a lot of love, hospitality, and care. It's been tough during this pandemic. It's been tough for all of us. But we got something very special here which is mind-blowing, because actually Christ, according to the, de de to the design of Christ, it can actually be way better. I dare say in one sense, our church government has been lacking. You have never had deacons here at Highland, and for most of you, I think, never in your life, in your Christian life. Think about that, isn't that interesting? Actually, now that I think about it, I have not either ever experienced EM deacon love and care given to me in my entire life as a Christian. So this is really something else. And I can guarantee, I can guarantee that love and care at Highland will explode in ways that we cannot even imagine. And I can guarantee that because this is how Jesus designed the church. This is Jesus' ministry. I'm not guaranteeing this because these five nominees are great men, though they are. I tell you the truth. We are entering into an, an exciting new era of more love, more care. I was by myself in this EM, which is technically a guyuk, just another small group. As an individual, I fail. And that's by design. It was not meant for me to be me, the only one who loves and cares for the EM in an, on, on an ordained basis. It's me plus others. More deacons, Lord willing, far future, more elders, English-speaking deacons, English-speaking elders. Let's get excited. I hope the next few weeks we're going to get more excited. I hope our... I hope you see that the future of our church is really bright. And so let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless our, our journey forward um, as we consider the book of Acts, um, as we consider the acts of Jesus our King. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Thank you for um, just your word, this story, this account in the book of Acts, chapter 6. And we are encouraged to see, first and foremost, that Jesus, you, you do your church. You run your ministry. You are actively 
ministering to us even now. Your session is happening. Your rule, your authority, your shepherding, your love and care. We are about to nominate and ordain and uh, pass and vote on and ordain deacons, hopefully an elder as well, deacons also in the cam and Kwonsanims in the cam. Help us to understand what this is all about. Help us to be excited about the future of our church. Bless our nominees as they take their exams, as they get ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.